Hi, I'm Charles Kirsch, host of Backstage Babble, and this is one of the most exciting nights of my life, and hopefully yours too. And what I'm talking about, of course, is the 50th anniversary reunion panel of the groundbreaking musical Follies that you are all here to see. As the New York Times critic Frank Rich said about a very different show, from now on, there will always be two groups of theater goers in this world, those who have seen Follies and those who have not. Those who did always have a special glow whenever they mention the experience. Those who haven't will forever be envious of those who did. And on April 4th, 1971, this show that would become a phenomenon after playing 12 previews officially open to audiences and critics for the first time. The show then ran for 522 performances, closing in July of 1972. Many revivals and other productions have taken place since then, yet none are spoken about with quite the same reverence as the original. It changed the lives of everyone who saw it, it's fair to say. And tonight we have a very special treat for everyone in addition to the panel, which is that we will be showing rarely if ever before seen footage of the original Broadway cast, including Who's That Woman, said to be the greatest production number of all time. But without further ado, I think you'll want to meet the panel of distinguished guests from the cast and creative team of the original production. And they'll turn on their videos as I say their names and then we can jump right in. Um, first, we have Mary Jane Houdina. Mary Jane played young Hattie and assisted Michael Bennett in the original production. And among her other Broadway credits are I'm Solomon, Annie, Moose Murders. That was the show, by the way, that Frank Rich was actually referring to in that quote, Into the Light, Rock My Hamlet, and more. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. And Next, we have the show's casting director, Joanna Merlin. Some might also know that name from your worn out CDs of Fiddler on the Roof. And yes, this is the <laughs> same Joanna Merlin who played Seidel in that original production. She also cast Into the Woods, Evita, Sweeney Todd on the 20th Century Company and more. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. Lovely to be here. <laughs> So next we have Susan L. Shulman, the press agent of Follies. So the reason that you heard about the original production, if you were around then, was probably her. Her other credits as publicist include State Fair, Company, Applause, Dancing, Crazy for You, and more. Thank you for being here. Hi, Charles. So we have two of the younger versions of the four main characters. First, the legendary Kurt Peterson, who you may know from West Side Story at City Center, Dear World, producing Sondheim, a musical tribute, and more. And he, of course, originated the role of young Ben in Follies. Hi. Hi, Charles. Great to be here. Great to, to be here with my colleagues and friends. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So. Although they may not have ended up together within the show, we also have Marty Rolf here, who you may remember from her wonderful, wonderful performance as young Sally. Broadway patrons will also remember her from Good News and as Top Tim in The King and I on Tour and in The Benefits Children and Art and Sondheim, a musical tribute. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Hi. Nice to see you, Charles. Thank you. So next, the man who, as I like to say, literally wrote the book on Follies, none other than Ted Chapin, who also served as the production assistant. He played the same role on the Rothschilds, Two by Two and more, assistant directed the Sunshine Boys, and now is the president of the Rogers and Hammerstein organization. Great to be here. Good to see everybody. Thank you. So... And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Michael Mesita, young Vincent from the show, who's taken a break from dancing the Bolero de Amor to be with us here today. His other credits include Equus, Applause, and The Fig Leaves Are Falling. <coughs> Hello, Mike. Hi. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So without further ado, I want to get to my first question, which is for those of you who haven't said so already, how did your first involvement with Follies come to be, either through an audition or? I went to the audition. Audition was in the paper and I got my tap shoes and my shoes and got my best dress and went and danced for all day <laughs> and got called back, sang my song. I think we I think we came back twice. I don't remember, but I remember we were there for a long time. And um, and that's how I got the job. Michael hired me and 
along with Michael and the other dancers and we set off on our journey. Yeah. So that's how I started. I, I auditioned in Los Angeles. I was actually thought I was auditioning for a, a tour of company, um, um, <laughs> this tour of company and, uh, and ended up in Follies after I, I just had I, my my I had funny I every job I got seemed like a funny audition a weird audition as I I don't know if you remember in the follies it was pouring rain in LA I forget what theater we were at we were auditioning at it was pouring rain and they were hours behind and my accompanist had to leave and it was just the oddest <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird audition. Um, I sang, and then Hal came down and said, "Would you um, sing? Do you have any Rodgers and Hammerstein?" And I picked up. I had a whole big pile of music, and I said, "Well, pick something." And he picked. What's the use of wondering? And he said, "I don't want you to. I don't want you to play the song. I want you to sell it to the balcony." He said, I don't, you don't worry about what the song means, just sell it to the balcony. So I sell, sold it to the balcony. He was like a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know. and, and then Michael Bennett said, said, can you tap dance? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, show me a time step. I did a time step it was one of the two steps I actually knew. And I did that anyway. And Hal said, well, you'll be hearing from us. And I kind of said, well, yeah, right. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh. And walked out and went home. And my then husband said, what'd you do today, dear? And I told him and he said, do you know who that is? <laughs> oh my gosh. And then I was just like, no, I was really naive and stupid basically. <laughs> so, so that was it. And I got called two weeks later. I had to go to New York. It was amazing. Marty, naive got us cast. <laughs> what? Naive got us cast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Naive. maybe. <laughs> well, Hal told me later that when I walked out on the stage, he said, that's Dorothy. Or I was very similar to Dorothy. Yeah. So yeah. he told me that later, like months and months later. So I don't know. Here I am. It was hard. It was hard find, finding four young people who could be, who could replicate the older uh, actors. It was, yeah. it was quite yeah. a search. So yeah. we were very happy to have you, Marty. Thank you. Well, I was very happy to be had. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, That's it's, it's interesting that, that when I first started casting, um, at that time in equity, there were equity principal interviews. You couldn't audition anybody. You just had to talk to them for three minutes. Oh. And, and suddenly these older women in their seventies turned up because they had been Follies girls in the twenties oh. or thirties. Oh my God. And, and so, and I had all these conversations with these older women and it was, it was kind of heartbreaking because they brought their headshots from when they oh. were all these girls. Oh wow! And um, but it was it was really an interesting experience, and a lot of them were you know hadn't worked for so many years, and and were kind of expecting that they might get another job. So oh. it, was, it was sad, but um, uh, but it was an interesting experience for me. Yeah. I, so I remember just one quick I remember oh. when I was so scared to be in New York by myself and I remember Mary Jane actually was when they handed me a card and said you have to go to Barbara Gutierrez you have to go for a costume fitting and I went in the bathroom and cried because I didn't know how to get there I didn't know where it was and they gave me the address and I had no idea how to get there and Mary Jane's the one who who told me how to get there, what train to take and how to get you know there. I remember that you were hysterical I was. I was. Yeah. I was like, and then I had to come back. I had to get back. <laughs> Follies was the first show that I cast from the get go for Hell. I had started in the middle of casting company, and um, most of the principals had been cast. So Follies was the first um, 
total casting that I did. And it was pretty intimidating uh, mm -hmm. looking for all those movie stars. Um, and there were no computers, no internet. Uh, everything was done by phone and uh, snail mail. Wow. Um, so it was it was quite an experience, but it was incredibly exciting to see the show begin to form as as the cast sort of came together, and um, it was just a great start. Well, I happen to have a, a page twenty five in Ted Shapin's book. He told the story. <laughs> Three people came into audition. Uh, fortunately for me. Uh, uh, John Seifer, who was originally going to play older Ben, uh, decided or, or uh, didn't end up doing it, and they hired John McMartin, and so they had to change the young young person, or at least find a young person. I don't know if they even had one, but Joanna Merlin brought me in. Thank you, Joanna. You changed my life for that call. Uh, he reads some scenes with the stage manager, and see, everyone seems pleased. John Martin is summoned. John McMartin was summoned to see what they would look like together, since they'd be playing the same person at different ages. Well, said Hal, looks over the years the nose has changed shape a bit, but we can play with some putty. John <laughs> asked him to <laughs> say, "No, it's fine, okay." Kurt chats, then fills the room with his large voice in lonely town, and everyone is pleased. He stands there smiling with his hands in his peacoat, looking somewhat sheepish. When asked how old he is, he says 22, 23 in February, to which Hal replies, no, I didn't hear that. You are 22. <laughs> You're somewhat dumbstruck. Well, says Hal, I hope to see you in rehearsal. Kurt says, thank you very much. Then Kurt beats his pace to retreat. And as he leaves, a toothbrush falls from his pocket. So <laughs> I was called in. It was after an all-night party. And I just sort of, you know, staggered into the room. and. <laughs> Luck would have it. I, I was cast as Young Ben and Follies, and it changed my life. <laughs> what amazing detail in that book. I mean, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Um, I, I said to somebody, you know, after all the celebration of the 50th anniversary, my royalties may go up to $10. It'll be really good. <laughs> I completely talked my way into Follies. Um, there's no question about it. I had seen Company, it had completely blown my mind. And um, as a precursor to what Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote, I wanted to be in the room where it happened. I knew these guys were doing this show the next year. And I talked Hal Prince into letting me observe it. And I talked the college I was going to into letting me observe it. Good, overstating it on both sides a little bit. Um, but I finally, Ruthie Mitchell said, okay, I guess if Hal says it, it's okay. And I showed up on the second day of rehearsal. And, and for me, and I, I said this in the book, you know, luckily it was so over budget that they didn't really have a lot of staff people. So I became a production assistant, which is part of why, you know, I got to know the cast more because I, I had a position to be there. I wasn't just sitting there looking and taking notes. Although if I said that putty, I would have, that would have been in the notes that I wrote that day. Cause I did say, I don't want to pretend I remember what people said 30 years ago. <laughs> I remember when you said to me, though, we were sitting next to each other watching, I think, The Mirror Number, and you said, you know, I'm going to write a book about this. Wow. Oh, no, that was Larry Cohen who was going to write a book. Actually, I was not. I, I, I was thought just you taking... said you were going to do that. Well, I had no, I no interest that. in that. No? I, I was writing a report for school. Maybe I said that. Um, Maybe that's what you said. But, but, uh, I remember yeah. you were going to write something. Well, yeah, okay. But when you I, called I, me a couple years guilt. later, I was like, oh, oh, he's read it. <laughs> I don't, I don't recall great. the auditions. I only recall uh, when they asked all the boys to dance with Graziella, they wanted to find a partner for her. And I remember that rather vividly. We each uh, worked with her and I was fortunate to my family that my mother taught me to dance with a woman. And uh, I danced with my sister for many years. So I felt very comfortable with her. We, we fit like a glove. I mean, she was terrific. Oh, so, but I don't remember the other part of the audition at all. Hmm. I'm honored to be in such good company. I didn't audition for this, but my first big job in the theater as a press agent was applause. And I was on applause because Lauren Bacall announced to the producers that the only person she would talk to in the Bill Dahl office was me. Oh, wow. So at 22 or 23, I wound up handling what was then the biggest show on Broadway. And my next big job was working with, as Mary Bryant's associate on Follies and Company. So I kind of went from, you know, one magic show to two magic shows. And it was 
I probably the best part of it was that I could go to both shows anytime I wanted. Uh, so I saw Folly uh, a lot. So I know all of you very well, although you don't. Uh, know. Uh, that's amazing. Well, I'm sure that David Bird's logo didn't hurt this, but I do want to ask you, Susan, how you found the sort of key to selling this show. Uh, well, I wasn't there when they picked that <laughs> logo, believe me, it's fabulous. Um, the thing that I remember most about working on Follies was how diverse the response was. Either people loved it or hated it. And it was, it was so extreme, you know, either they got it or they didn't get, it. you know, when, when Loveland started, some people were just transfixed and other people would leave. I mean, they just didn't know what the hell was going on. And it was fascinating because when you would, when we would pitch stories, we never really knew what the response was going to be from the press because either people were euphoric and said, oh my God, yes, I'll talk to anybody in the company. I thought it was fabulous. Or they would say, I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Um, it was really interesting. The, the other thing that was very interesting to me was that this show was supposed to be starring Dorothy Collins. She yeah. was supposed to be the focus. And from what I understand, it started when Hal did She Loves Me. And it was evidently down to, and Joanna, maybe you know this more than I, it, what I've heard and read was that it was between Dorothy Collins and Barbara Cook for the lead in She Loves Me. Mm -hmm. And supposedly Hal Prince flipped a coin or whatever, but he decided on Barbara Cook. And he said to Dorothy Collins, I promise you, I will have a, sh I will do a show for you. And Follies was the show. And so what was really interesting was that it started out, as I understand it, to be about Dorothy's character. And somewhere along the way, it morphed into something else. And even though she wasn't the star star the way I think she probably thought she would, she always said it was the cherry on the cake for her, that this show, that it was such a happy time for her. And she was so grateful that she didn't, she, she never minded the fact that she was uh, got a little bit short shrift, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, she was really mostly known for being on the hit parade. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's how I knew her. We used yes. to listen to the hit parade all the time. Um, but I think as the show was so important to her as an actress, yes. uh, as well as a singer. And of course, losing my mind was just, just oh. blew everybody away. I mean, it was, uh, it, it, I still have the image of her singing it and it's such a gorgeous song. So I think she was really very happy. I don't think she was unhappy. Yeah, I have something called the red dress theory. Yes, yes, and, uh, yes. You know, and, uh, and Alexis, of course, was, was tall and statuesque and had the red dress and all over, you know. And, but I, I, I agree, Dorothy's performance in that. And I think so many people who, who ever saw it I think it was one of the finest performances ever, ever and certainly the best salad ever. ever. And she was nominated ever. for Tony um, for it. And Alexis won, yes, but, yeah, but yeah. you know, I think that was a yeah. great honor. And when I was doing the book, Harvey Evans told me a wonderful story, which I think I put in there, that apparently years later, both Alexis and Dorothy were invited to see a production of Follies in Houston. Mm -hmm. and and it had an intermission at that point. And in the intermission, Alexis took Dorothy by the hand and pulled her into the ladies room where no one was there and looked right at her and said, until tonight, I had no idea how brilliant you were in the original production. Direct from Phoenix Live and in person, Sally Durant, here she is at last, twinkle in her eyes. You, isn't it? Phyllis. Of course it's me. You came, you're here. Oh, look at you. <laughs> I want to hug you, but I can't. You're like a queen. You're like Jackie Kennedy. Oh, what a thing to say. I'm talking silly. Well, if you can, I can. Oh. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> it's just that out in Phoenix, nothing like this ever happens. I don't think I've slept in days. I'm so excited. Sally, you look just as cute as ever. Me? I'm a mess. I've got a tummy. My hair's too bleached. Oh, who cares? New York's all 
changed. I couldn't even find the theater tonight and this afternoon. When I walked past 44th and 3rd, oh, Phil, it wasn't there. What was it? Our apartment where we lived. Don't you remember? Five lights up. I did the cleaning and you cooked. Baked beans and peanut butter sandwiches. You never made the beds. <laughs> I still don't. Remember that awful bathtub in the kitchen? And the racket when the L went by. You know, I think I loved it. You were homesick and you cried a lot. Oh, but we had fun. You married Buddy, didn't you? He always liked you, Phil. I always liked him, too. And you married Ben. I know, I read about you in the magazine. I even saw your living room in Vogue. It's blue. It's Ben in Europe. Oh, no, he's not with the UN anymore. He's here now. Good night. Phil, would you tell me something? If I can. Um, but yeah. I just think it's kind of cool because it's like, yeah, Alexis came in from Hollywood. Nobody really gave her the time of day. You know, she was a, you know, a, a grade B or C um, actress. She used to say that there was a, a list of people that she would know if it was offered to this person, didn't get it, this person didn't take it, then they would get, get to her. And she, it just was a, 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 the right role at the right time. And she had all the, all the stat, the sort of statuesque chilliness and yet, you know, she was great. Yeah. She was great. I, I didn't Ooh, realize, dance. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how brilliant Dorothy was. I mean, I knew she was, but I didn't know how much until that she was out one night. I think she was out one time and um, I forget Jan Clayton or somebody did the role and, and yep. it was just a different show. It was weird. It was weird. She was brilliant. She was brilliant. She was wonderful. Just wonderful. Yeah. And a nice yep. person too. Good yeah. Time. You know, uh, <laughs> Joey Tubins, that was Alexis' hairdresser. She had, he had a lot to do with grooming her. Mm -hmm. He groomed her about the way she dressed, the way she walked. He wanted her to be the star of the show. And he would say that all the time. And so everything he did for her was so that she would stand out more and more, even off stage after the show and whatnot, to mm -hmm. become more of the star of the show. Uh, I didn't consider that necessarily a bad thing because I adored Dorothy and really kind of thought of, uh, Dorothy and Yvonne and Alexis as being the stars of the show. I got this from Dorothy. <laughs> Opening night. Uh -huh. I played sail sailors uh -huh. in my musical. Oh, that's great. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's great. I, mean, I, I, think a, we, I think we all got this. Was I this still have we did. mine, yes. I still yeah. have my opening night. Yep. 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 You know, when they say that she'll give you the coat off her back, she yeah. really would. She wore yeah. her white mink in one one night and i was talking to her about something she said oh here she said would you like to borrow this she took it off her body and gave it to me i said oh no 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 i couldn't possibly do that she was just a besides being brilliant she was just a wonderful person yeah, yeah she was. i loved her i have a history with Ivonne de carlo <laughs> we were sisters in the ten commandments oh. she oh. was she was the leading lady and oh. uh, there were seven sisters, so I was one of them. Oh, my. <laughs> and, um, I but, love uh, that. We did work together. And uh, the first day on set, uh, the six sisters were uh, at, the at the well of Midian. Um, and um, they had dressed us in these very faded costumes to make us look biblical and um, lots of jewelry. We were the daughters of the sheikh, um, Jethro. And uh, Yvonne walked on stage, uh, on the stage of the sound stage, and she was wearing this very simple white dress with leather bands around her wrists and a, a leather band in her hair looking gorgeous. And she took a look at us and said, you look like the old Yvonne de Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> she had just been doing all these exotic parts and oh. movies and stuff and she was actually wonderful in the ten commandments uh i think it was a big uh, a, a big change for her in her career because it was a very serious dramatic role yeah. and she actually was wonderful amazing i heard her tell somebody one time she said uh, she was in conversation and she said, oh, I was Moses' wife in the Ten Commandments. 
certainly was. Yeah, because she couldn't think better than Moses, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I was Moses' wife. So. <laughs> I liked them all. I liked to hear all their stories. And Mary McCarty would tell stories. I, I wound up sitting there. I, I felt like a, I, well, I was still pretty young, but I would listen to these stories fly back and forth, and I would just sit there and listen, you know? I did the same. <laughs> yeah, I, the I just same. loved it. They, they would get together uh, in between rehearsals. And they'd all sit there and uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. just chat about how Broadway used to be, yep. and how they used to do this and that. And Ethel told a story about how she would she'd perform in several theaters a night, mm -hmm. and a car would pick her up to take her to the next theater to perform, and then it would pick her up to take her to the next yeah. theater to perform. Yeah. I never said anything. I just sort of sat there you just and listened. And listened. Yeah. Michael, yeah, yeah. didn't you didn't you say you used to stand behind the curtain every night when Dorothy sang uh, "Losing My Mind"? I did almost every night. I missed a couple, but uh, uh, we sort of had this thing. I don't remember how it really came about, but I think in the beginning, she was a little nervous about the song when we were out of town. And I said, I'm going to stand behind the curtain and just listen to you because I love this song and the way you do it. And it became something we did a lot. And sometimes she would say, uh, Michael, are you going to be back there? And I'd go, yeah, yeah, I'll be back there. You know, so it just became a little bit of a thing that the two of us had together that we would do. Like I have to say that, that you were on my list of I don't know how to get a hold of him when I wrote the book. I think uh, I asked Gra Grazi and, and, she, and she said, I don't know where he is. And to be quite honest with you, I never thought much about Follies after the show was over and I was on to other things until uh, I think it was until Facebook. And I began to see uh, that a, a lot of people on that site know much more than I do about Follies. It's true. I don't know. We yeah, were, we were kind of just in it. And so yeah. they say, well, what kind of shoes did so-and-so wear before she changed? Uh, and I'm like, I have no idea. I, whoever thought of that, yeah. I, you know, I didn't know, but I, I learned more from the people on it than uh, myself speaking about it. Yeah. That, yeah. that company that was in Houston uh, that Harvey was talking about, I choreographed it. And um, the first day of rehearsal, I walked in and this young man came up to me and just looked at me and said, Sonia Lefkova. And I said, how do you know that? Because she was the older woman who swung the older women, the character ladies, you know, and you wouldn't know that unless you really were involved, you know, and this guy knew everything. And I, that's when I realized how it was really becoming a cult, the show. People loved that, loved it, knew everything about it. No, who else would know that name? Sonia Lefkova. Yeah, I often wondered what happened to her because yeah. she was pretty old then, you know, it's, it, I'm sorry that I didn't stay in touch with her because she used to call me her teacher because I taught her the mirror number, you know, yeah. and uh, and she was this little Russian lady that and she practiced every day and she must have been 108 then, you know, <laughs> and uh, but when that fella came up to me, in fact, when all this started coming out about the 50th anniversary, this, this young man just put me on, on Messenger. He said, hi, Sonia Lefkova. <laughs> and I, and I, I said to him, you know, when you said that to me that day, it took me by surprise. It really did, because I thought, how does he know? That? And I said to him, how do you know that? You know, it's just that people that love the show know everything about the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's true. And, and they have to be asked, corrected every now and then they have to be corrected but that's what we're yeah, here for yeah but you know <laughs> like somebody, somebody said no did all of the ghosts in the opening mouth the songs and i thought no they didn't you know it was something i did but the other girls didn't do that we so did four of was, us did you did right did the, you too the, yeah the four in the opening yeah the yes opening. yeah 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 but the, i knew that the other girls hadn't but i didn't remember if you guys did or not we did but on uh, opening night on uh, of the first preview they i they said you know places you know it's time to go and i didn't have a costume and i right. went down and they were in i went to the basement and they were sewing it together <laughs> <laughs> so i was half sewn when i went they were half sewn and many oh, pins god <laughs> were those costumes gorgeous oh, they were you know for me as a dancer and i i had done three broadway shows before that already i that show to me, though, was to me what I thought 
I was going to always do. It was a real Broadway yeah. show, you know. Yeah. And opening night, I think everybody felt this way. Everybody felt like something important was happening. Everybody yeah. in the dressing room had a dozen roses from somebody, you know. You could barely see from the tchotchkes on the mirror. Broadway show should be. I think I was right? too busy I, worrying about that great stage. Stage. And oh, hoping yeah. that I don't, I believe both of us don't fall into the pit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know I, that. The, the first time I went on, because Michael and I said before, we tapped in the basement, five of us. But if a girl was sick, I would go in. And the I never had a fitting. I had to wear that girl's costume. And the costumes, how how have you wear that? I don't remember exactly, but they were like 35 pounds. 35 pounds. 40 pounds? 35 pounds. 45? 35, I think. 35, that's what I thought. You're well, heavy. you know, now I never had this costume on. And they pinned me into the costume. And in the circle going around, we the girls spun away from the circle. My particular spot that night, I spun downstage and you know that costume kept spinning. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going in the pit. Who thinks of that? You know, I actually had the presence of mind to grab the bottom of the skirt and I pushed it back so I could turn up stage because of that rake. And yeah. we were flat, it wouldn't have been wow. so bad. But I really thought I was going in the pit. Yeah. I know those things were heavy. They were heavy. And when you turned, they you were right. They did they turned more they than kept you did. going. They yeah, kept they would moving. they would stop. And I didn't know that because I had never had it on, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Didn't one night didn't you get caught in your beads? Oh, the beads, the, those the helmets beads. thing, the yes. beads in the helmets. And they kept break. And then they but, would tinkle tinkle down into the into the uh, hitting the, the drum orchestra pit in the orchestra kept pit. Flopping. They were dropping on everybody. Yeah. They so, were something, but that rake too, the rake itself, it, it, you kind of had totally stand cockeyed, you know, if you were on the bottom rake, like when we did Lucy and Jesse, mm -hmm. you, and Michael, you mentioned this on Facebook the other day about being on the top. Remember when we first started it, I was on the top. He put the smallest one on top and then he flipped it. When that first time we did it and the curtain opened, I felt like I had forgotten my pants. Because, you know, you can't sell something if you make a mistake, if you're not facing the audience, right? <laughs> it was the most weird experience. I felt like I had forgotten something. Well, you felt completely alone when you were up there. Yes. You yeah. couldn't watch anybody. Yeah. So those yeah. mirror things they had on the wall were yeah. uh, so strange. You looked weird. You felt like you were in a dream or something. So it was very hard to keep your concentration and do everything right because you're at the top yeah. and everybody else yep. is behind you. I would have given anything to keep you up there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and one put night, me down somewhere else. And, and one night, Michael changed some of the choreography. I don't remember exactly how this was because he hadn't flipped us yet and we hadn't changed the number, but he, he fixed something and I made him a little mistake. And obviously three or four people were following me because I heard like four S words behind me. <laughs> Because <laughs> they had followed me and then realized that they had done it wrong as well. <laughs> so it is, you're right, it's a totally different perspective to being on the floor or being at that top, yeah. you know. But it was a brilliant move because you looked like you were 20 feet tall up there. I yeah. kind of felt like I was 20 feet tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I started the mirror number on the highest rake, but facing upstage. And that yeah. was an experience. That was, yeah. that was crazy. That we, we you know, it. one of the most exciting auditions was Ethel Chate, oh. who did oh. Broadway Baby. You I know, bet. who didn't see the show have, have heard the song sung by so many other people like Elaine Stritch and, and often just brilliantly, but Ethel Chate is my favorite. I mean, when yeah. she when she did that audition, it was so authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, she was a lady. She was in mm -hmm. her 70s. I think she was yeah. 74, Ted. But she was 74. She, I think so. But she had her 75th birthday while we were doing the show. Yeah. 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 And she was what so she excited. Was you know, she brought so much of her own life to that mm -hmm. show. Yeah. And she so did. it was, it was, um, you know, all of us who were watching just kind of were, bre were, were breathless because it was so perfect. Yeah. How the 42nd Street to be in a show From the dark from Battery Park Way up to Washington Heights Someday maybe All my dreams will be repaid 
And people didn't re- people didn't realize how no. crippled she was with arthritis. Oh, uh, yeah. I used to walk with her up the stairs because her dressing room was way up on top, and uh, she would as soon as she got on the stage, you would never know that. I mean, she yeah. just yeah. gave everything well, she had. As soon as she what, came off, she turned into a crippled old lady again. One uh, night when she came on, because I followed her, she would come in. You know, they make their entrance at the top, and then if you were their young person, you would make your way to them, and I would follow her downstage. One night, I almost reached out to grab her because her arthritis was so bad. She was almost like it was like a potato with two tooths, you know, she couldn't like maneuver. And I thought, oh my God, she's going to go in the pit. And I, I started to reach out to her, and she hit the bottom of the stage and and stopped. She stopped like she would, you know, yeah. that look that she'd get, she'd look all over and then she'd go, yep, I'm here. And she'd turn and she would go. But I got, I was scared that I almost reached out to grab her because I thought she's not going to stop. She had terrible arthritis and you would never know it. Not on stage. Have, no. no. have you all seen the film of Whoopi from 1930? With that yes. Mm-hmm. It's on YouTube. And oh, just, yeah. Yes. In the last past couple of years, I, I just, I, I, I saw it for the first time and I was just flabbergasted because it was a Busby Berkeley, early Busby Berkeley, I believe. And she obviously created a lot of her own choreography and the way she moved her legs was so unique. And she used some of it when she did Broadway Baby. Yes, she did. That thing stuck to me. If you haven't seen it, just uh, Google Ethel Shatea, a whoopee from 1930. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Amazing. You see it you see it immediately the, those steps that she did. Yeah. I think at that time they called those crazy legs because when I worked with Peter Gennaro, uh-huh. he used to do things like that and he'd say these are called this called crazy legs. Hers were unique though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, some of the more difficult roles to cast were um, Weissman because mm-hmm. Uh, Ted, do you remember the the high note that he had to sing? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it was it was. Uh, you're, the, you're the vocal coach here. Yeah, the end, the yeah. beautiful girls <laughs> and wow. and find someone of that age who could also act, um, and hit that note was mm-hmm. really hard. You mean so, Roscoe, Joanna? Awesome. Roscoe. It was yeah. Yeah, Roscoe. Roscoe. Yeah, Roscoe. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Weissman was yeah. Weissman was non singing. Weissman yeah. was oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Michael um, Clark. That was yeah. Michael. He was wonderful. I mean, and it was it was uh, such a relief. He had a little trouble with the lyrics. I remember nothing respect nothing respectable half so injectable. Girls number. Right. The the other the other difficult well it was all hard, but but to find these ghosts of the Follies girls, who were Hal wanted them to be six feet tall, and be able to move gracefully. So um, we didn't actually need dancers, but you know I looked for dancers. I looked for models because they were, you know, they ended up with high heels six feet tall and then those headdresses that were like two feet tall and so they were they were these giant ghosts and their height was important um so that was um that was quite a quite a search but uh 
I think it turned out well. They were oh, they were beautiful. Mostly, sometimes I got away with a five eleven. <laughs> you know, you know uh, Fifi Dorsey never quite grasped the concept of ghosts. No, she in the opening number she would come over to me and hit me on the shoulders as if to say, "How you doing?" You know, and I, I backstage I would say, "Fifi, you don't touch me because I you can't see me. I'm a ghost." She, oh, right, right, right. Next night she'd do it again. And finally, Michael came up and, and said, "Fifi, he's a ghost." You can't see him. And she'd go, oh, right, right, right. And then she'd do it again. She did it so many times. I, I you know, I tried to maneuver myself to avoid her. Poor thing. She just I that. She didn't understand that. You know, those the, the showgirls, uh, Ursula was tall, very, very tall. But you know, her, our bodies were the same. <laughs> Not nearly that tall, right? So one day when they called uh, 15, she put my costume on, my... <laughs> my opening cast and I put that long beaded dress on well on her the dress fit just to the crack of her butt right it hung below my butt you know but I got the dress on and her, my costume looked like a tutu on her and we went down at five and Fritz Holt looked at us and we were ready and he said all right girls but and you know and I had her headdress on which was this huge plume and it covered my derriere because it was hanging out but we went down like that and we had the best laugh. But it was oh, funny yeah. because she was so tall. Yeah. But by, the torso, we were the same length. Isn't that oh, funny? That's mm -hmm. funny? But Fritz said, all right, girls. <laughs> you know, the, the people in this show were absolutely wonderful. If the one show was associated with the show that I in any way didn't like, I, they, you, were, you were all so much it was fun. I really appreciated that. We yeah, had a great time, really. We did have a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So here's a question for Joanna Merlin about casting this. So you were mentioning about the ghosts and the showgirls, but in terms of Ben and Buddy and Phyllis and Sally, what sort of direction did Hal Prince give you in terms of what kind of person to look for? Well, we needed to have someone who could act, sing, and dance. And, um, and Hal felt that they should be very established, if not movie stars, that, that older movie stars had the kind of essential quality uh, that we were looking for in the Follies girls. They're, they, you know, movie stars who perhaps had not been in, in A movies, you know, um, and so um, uh, everybody was kind of collaborating on throwing out names of movie stars and, you know, and women and men who could do this. And, um, uh, and we would call the agents because Hal would audition everybody. And often the agent said, well, you know, my client is not going to audition for this role. You have to offer it to them. Mm -hmm. But Hal didn't do that. Uh, and so they did, Alexis came in and Dorothy came in and Jean Nelson came in. They all auditioned. Um, and uh, we were very lucky, I think, to get the cast that we did because, um, you know, they... I, I think that they were, they were kind of um, the the right. They brought the right element, and they were very talented. I mean, and yeah. all those. I mean, to find someone uh, uh, for a Sondheim musical who can act, sing, and dance, uh, and sit and do those lyrics <laughs> um, was a, a challenge. So I think I think we were all pretty happy with the original cast. I, I think I don't I, think I would don't think you could do that's why I don't think you could do the show as grandly as it was done because that whole historical tradition of the stars of the older stars I don't think that exists. I mean it doesn't. You know it, I, it had, they had the glamour of the old Hollywood and the old movie stars and. They were amazing. They were really, they were really movie stars, mm -hmm. really. And because now I've done the show several times and we've done good productions with good people, you know, and the one time that I thought it was more like anything that it should be was at Main State Music Theater 
but those people were stars there. You know how in a summer theater, certain people be, get known every year and they come back every year. And I thought it worked there. But I have to tell you, as all the productions that I've done, they were good productions, but I don't think there'll ever be, ever be anything to touch that, that Broadway company, everybody in it, even the, the secondary characters, all of them, you know, were just perfect. They were all just perfect. I, I was, I tell you, when I went to see it that time, I was on vacation and I came back early and I thought, I'm going to go see the show. I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by it. I, I, and I was, all I could think was, I'm in that show. <laughs> I'm in that show, you know? You know, and there, you know, everybody after you're in the show about a year, you kind of grumble about things. And I was in this Lucy and Jesse number, I'd be on the bottom. I could see when people made mistakes or whatever. And that's where my mind goes, because that's what I do now. I direct and I choreograph, right? But even then I was a, I was a great assistant. I, I'll say that, I was a great assistant. And I saw the mistake. You know, and I would see little things and I'd, I'd go to George Martin, who was wonderful. He was a wonderful stage manager and dance captain. Uh -huh. And I said, didn't you see that? Didn't you see that? And, you know, when I saw it from the front, I said, it didn't matter. The whole was together. Those little mm -hmm. niggly things. I learned a great lesson doing that, mm -hmm. going and seeing the show. Everybody should be able to get out of the show and see a show like that if they're in it, because you, you wouldn't complain about anything. Yeah. Oh, you know, Hal had the ability, I mean, over the years, I was with him for 14 years, and he had the ability to conceive the feeling of the whole before the show even began uh, to, to go into rehearsal. Uh, he had a concept, and that's what made his work yeah. so extraordinary, I think. Yeah. He had a vision of what it needed yeah. to be. And, um, and I think that that's kind of what you're talking yeah. about. Yes. Is, that, that is, that, is that vision. That yeah. and I, I think now it's gotten so corporate. Broadway's gotten so corporate and so many people have input and, and it was yeah. Hal who had the concept and saw it out to the end and Hal and Michael and you know the, the, the people who yeah. worked it was amazing. I also like always pointing. I, I like pointing out to people that that the the major creators uh, who we now all think of as all of them giants hadn't quite established the position that they got to. So they were hungry. How <laughs> you know, quite you know admired as a director yet? Mm -hmm. Steve Sondheim company yes, but you know everybody and Michael you know wanted to direct. So so I I think yeah. we were all the beneficiaries of their yeah. artistic hunger to do it beyond what they thought they could. And yeah. that's what I think just- yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. One, one person that we haven't talked as much about yet is John McMartin. And off that, I do want to show you all this poster here and ask you about this because not only is it not the David Byrd logo we all know, but as you can see, we don't see John McMartin's name on this. We only see the name three. So does anyone want to talk about this? Well, this is a flyer that was in the Colonial Theater. I, I, I grabbed, I think, three or four of these. Oh. I've given them to people over the years. I mean, I, I didn't one. get one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, but, it, but yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I would imagine Susan would know this better than I, but, you know, they needed a flyer, uh, you know, and also, Frankly, it's only one color, black and white in one color. And you know, the, with all due respect to the fabulous poster, there are many, many, many colors in that David Bird thing. And if you're gonna do a flyer to, to remember this, write out, for, mail in for tickets and could cut out the bottom. So yeah, that's from the Colonial and, and yeah. you know, I still have at least one. Well, maybe. I wonder what John, wonder what John <laughs> thought of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you ever get feedback from John about that? No, I think, I, out? I think he was left out because he wasn't cast yet when they did it. Because yeah. I actually do have, I have oh. a, the, the David Bird logo um, ad in a, a Boston paper that has John Cypher's name uh, in the ad. Oh, wow. oh. So obviously, John Cypher leaving and John coming in was all, I don't, Joanna will probably remember the, you know, it was very close to the beginning of rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of John McMartin, who I loved. Um, Two things. First of all, I had the opportunity two years ago to, to uh, purchase uh, John's jacket from Follies. So Aww. I have 
I'm in my closet. I'm going to wait for a special occasion to wear John's jacket. I loved him. And I had, I, Me uh, too. I sat with Hal one afternoon. I had a fortune to just spend an hour with him uh, not too long before he passed. And, and he said that John, John was, John's performance was the best performance he'd ever seen in a musical. Oh, wow. Wow. Ever. And he loved it. He said, partially it's because I identified with his character, but beyond that, uh, he, he, he brought what I thought was real, was the reality of acting and, and the, the depth that, that musical theater can go to uh, in his performance. And uh, so that, that's very special because Hal's seen a lot of terrific people up here on yeah. the stage. <laughs> <laughs> you take one road, you try one door, there isn't time for any more. One's life consists of either or. One has regrets, which one forgets. And as the years go on, the road you didn't take hardly comes to mind, does it? The door you didn't try, where could it have led? The choice you didn't make never was defined, was it? Dreams you didn't dare are dead, were they ever there? Who said, I don't remember, I don't remember at all. And they were also friends. I mean, yes. Hal became yeah. a friend of John McMartin and then, of course, used him in other productions as well. And um, he was, he actually played my husband in another Broadway play. Oh, oh boy. And so I got to know him quite well. Yeah. Um, and he, he was he was an actor who was very modest mm -hmm. and and somewhat shy actually yes so shy. Yes. Um, but he was a very complicated and, and yeah. interesting person and I think just a, a brilliant actor mm -hmm. um, I um when I would rehearse like the mirror number sometimes Michael would send me with John or he would send me with Alexis I would also rehearse their dance sections I always tell everybody I was the low assistant on the totem pole because I got to do that, that kind of cleanup work, right? And John was so nervous about doing the live, laugh, and love, right? And so I said to him, this is what I'll do. When I turn up stage, we made a wedge. You know, we circled around him. And he was fine, most of it, but he had trouble coming in one spot. And success as well, success, right? And I would go five, six, seven, suck. And he would go success. I would throw it over my shoulder because I was on his right. Okay. So um, it then helped him. Sometimes he got off. One time he got so nervous. He said, I said, suck. He said, success as well. And then I spent the whole number counting for him, <laughs> you know, and um, years later, I did the taps backstage. They honored Michael Bennett, Larry Kurt, and um, um, oh, I just talked about him before. Our, our production stage manager, Fritz Holt That's at cool. uh, Lincoln Center. So, and I did the taps for Side by Side, right? And I saw Mr. Sondheim and, and Hal come towards me. We were on our break and I hadn't seen him for a very long time. And I said, hi, do you remember me? And, and uh, Hal said, of course I do. You used to throw John the sock. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> How are you? So, you know, People remember this stuff, and and but he was I love John. He was so sweet, oh. and he just was very concerned. He was always very focused, you know. And nobody, nobody went up on his on his lines with yeah. more terror. No, but, I mean I've seen many a production, and it always looks like an actor trying to act like yes. a, a character who isn't remembering the John. You just thought, oh my God, he's falling apart. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He did it. He, he was perfect. In too many mornings, we had a we had a. First of all, I thought he was one of the funniest people I ever know, and he he had these incredible <laughs> yeah. stories of his life before acting and stuff. He was a riot, but um, in too many mornings, the 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 running part underneath a place where he had to come in, he would get kind of lost in it. it. He didn't have the downbeat, yeah. and so uh, Steve told me to squeeze him when it, on his entrance. And, but I would squeeze him and sometimes he would come right in. So I'd squeeze it, he's in. Or sometimes I'd squeeze it, so then, I'd, then I'd squeeze and go, ah! so he'd take a breath yeah. to get him in yeah. the place. It was, a, it was crazy, crazy time. He, he, but he was, 
he was such a terrific guy. He was just such a wonderful he man. He was a really Very nice fun. guy. A nice yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ted, didn't didn't Yvonne keep forgetting the words of I'm still here? Of course. No. Of course. <laughs> she'd, sort of, she'd sort of get them, kind of. <laughs> And I remember at the beginning, there were references like Amos and Andy. She didn't know. So she would sing Amos and Randy. <laughs> like, no, no, that's, you know. Oh, version. <laughs> Yvonne, God love her. Oh. I loved her. I, I, you know, I told this story before we started, but I'm going to tell it again. When I was rehearsing the mirror number, we, I, I was, because I was still young, I was, we rehearsed the women like they, it was the girls, you know, and they, they would get tired and we had 45 minutes left. And I said, I gave him a break and I said, okay, like, come on, let's just do it one more time. I was a real cheerleader, right? And Yvonne looked at me and said, I don't think so. And so I said, okay, let's go, let's go home. And I went and got Fritz. I said, I think they've had it. So they dismissed the ladies that day. But, but, but she, she told you what she thought right there. It was just, no, I don't think so. And she wasn't being nasty or anything. She just, they had had it. I had over rehearsed them. But again, I think you, you and Michael and were so brilliant. At, I don't think the leading ladies all really understood they were going to be the backup to Mary McCarty in that number. No. And it's funny because every subsequent production I've seen, there's usually one of those ladies who's not in the mirror number. Mm -hmm. and the feeling that they said, I'll do the show, but I'm not dancing. I'm, doing I'm not that doing number. that number. <laughs> Nightly, daily, always laughing gaily. Seems I see her everywhere I go. Oh, who? That woman I know, I know. That woman so clever, but ever so sad. Love, she said, was a fad. The kind of love that she couldn't make fun of. She'd have none of who that woman, that cheery, weary woman who's dressing for yet one more spring. Each day I see her pass in my looking glass. Lord, 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 that woman is me. a wonderful number that was just uh, wonderful yeah looks so beautiful from the i never saw it from i got to see it once i got <laughs> i got a vacation with follies and my went i thought i'll go back and look at it and i was so overwhelmed about how beautiful it was yeah. i knew it was good but i i i was so teared up you know everything that i looked at i just said oh my god that's brilliant it was brilliant. I'm rereading this wonderful book that someone wrote, and on every other <laughs> every other page, they're going back to rehearse the mirror number. <laughs> every day. It started, every day. It started in prehistoric times. It continues to the present. They're still rehearsing it. Yeah, we're still rehearsing it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I did every day. You know, Michael would send me in the other room with the ladies. Right. And then as as things progressed, the girls would come. You know, I just remember facing a wall in the basement. Oh, please. <laughs> With that mic between our feet. Yes. You remember that? The first I time do. That I did that, when I went to do that first, because I did the solo tap, and the first time I went to do step touch, I went, oh my God, is this right? Because it was like an, an echo in there, you know? And there were yeah. just the five of us you, right. Steve Brookbar, Kenny Ermston, Roy. 
and me, right? Yeah, right. And, 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 and we were like squeezed on this little tap board. You would think that it would be this big space, <laughs> this big Broadway show, right? And um, when I started it, I thought, oh my God, is this right? That's just how it felt, you know? I never saw any of that film footage before. I know me either. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I never knew anyone ever took any film. Me either. Yeah. That that glittering, oh, you know, when the first start to see the mirrors in the back. I had once one time I did the show, um, and the star one of the backup star ladies, I realized that if I put her instead on the end, put her on the inside. So I only had one chance because you know it was one of those situations. It was in Detroit, Michigan. I I ran up. I, I had told her before the show, I said, instead of going on the end, just go to the next part and so-and-so is going to go on your other side. Because what I figured out was that if she could follow somebody, she would remember the step. Because going to the right, she could follow somebody. When, when she was on the end and turned around to come back, there was nobody to follow. So I said, just go there. And Judy, I think her name was, was going to go on your other side. Okay. She didn't do that. The guys in the pit laughed. I ran up, I jumped over the pit and I grabbed her and I moved her over because I knew that was the last time I was going to be able to have her see where she was supposed to go. And then she was okay after that. But those ladies didn't realize. And she told me, she said, you know, I, I would, because she taped me on a VHS. She said, you're the last thing I see in the, at night before I go to bed and the first thing I see in the morning. <laughs> she would go through that mirror number and she still had trouble with it. But it was a tough number. It was a long number. It was tough. For them, it was tough uh, for them. You know, this occurred here. I have another appointment, so I'm going to have to leave my dear friends. Oh, right now. I'm so so glad to see you. So 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 after you. all this time, I just can't have to. I just can't express my uh, gratitude enough, uh, Charles, for you for doing this, yeah. and to to my friends and colleagues who were so much a part of of, of, of what happened. It's uh, it is so special uh, yeah. to me as a, as a memory, and uh, just love you all, and I wish you all good health. Love and, you too. Uh, thank, thank you. You too. Thank Carol. you. Thank you, Kurt. You made a great contribution to the show. <coughs> thank you. Really yes. Did. Yes. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon. Okay. Yes. Bye. 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 So. I would love to show this little clip of Live, Laugh, Love because I want to ask you all after this about that moment where the breakdown happens and... When the winds are blowing, yes. that's the time to smile. Oh. Success is swell and success is sweet, but every height has a drop. The less achievement, the less defeat. What's the point of shoving? Get a boot from shooting off cable ground. Or buzzing bells to summon the staff. Some climbers get their kicks up. This was lying. This was lying. Just to, to ask you about that moment where the breakdown happens, what was that like to perform every night? I loved it. Yeah. It, <laughs> I thought, it, it, I thought it, was, it was a lot of fun. I, we had a situation, Gratz Dale and I, that if she was out of the show for a night, I would be out of the show for a night or, or and vice versa, because we couldn't take the chance of dancing with somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and I got to watch the show for the first time. And this, this whole section I found remarkable that we went through all of that, all the people involved and everybody backstage ready mm -hmm. to do their part to make this magic happen to the point where they were just sitting quietly on the stage. It was like the movie. Yeah. I appreciated the show so much more after seeing that, but being in that number, I watched it the other day, somebody sent a clip of it. And you know, I started kind of tearing up because I had forgotten about that number. I forgot that we were in it. And, her, and the song and everything. And uh, 
Uh, I enjoyed it because I loved stopping and looking at him, like what's the matter with him and, and uh, is he getting crazy and whatnot. And everything that went on thereafter, I thought it was a great moment in the theater. Yeah, it was a brilliant moment. It was, because it, it was so, uh, such a cacophony, but it all fit together. Yeah. <laughs> it just all fit together, you know, and, but it, it was so unusual for a dancer. I mean, the dancing in that particular thing wasn't so difficult. It was so stylized and it was about the acting. It was really not about the dancing. You know, I so I love that. I love that. And and then it was sort of like you just blew them off once you just, well, OK, we'll just dance over you. And we just so when it, <laughs> we, you know what I mean? We, yeah. we reacted a little bit to him and then it was sort of, OK, let's just keep going. And we piled up in the center and everybody came out and it was just crazed. The, I, I was before right before that, I was up on the catwalk stage right and waiting for the chaos entrance. And you, I, I could see the audience, some of the audience, when he started that, when he started that, yeah. when he started losing it, and they, you would just see people clutching, yeah, and going, oh, he's they, oh, he forgot. It was really yeah. shocking. It was yeah. really fun to watch. It was fun yeah. to watch. It was great. So, you know, the whole thing, all of that, that Lucy and Jesse and Live Laughing about because it wasn't a big, big ensemble you felt very sort of out there by yourself sometimes, even though we were all together. Mm -hmm. So you, I was always very aware of like making sure I was doing the right thing and my shoulder going right and you know, and then when he broke up like that, it, it just blew apart, it just exploded. Yeah. yeah. The story of Lucy and Jesse is, there's a lot of sort of debate over which characters in the show that is supposed to be about. So I would be curious to hear either your opinion or if someone said that to you at any point, either Sondheim or Hal Prince. I always just thought it was her psyche. She was either this or she was that, you know, what does she yeah. want to be? Yeah. You know, she's either uptown or she's down in the gutter, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I, I mean, I, the, the song that was written before that Uptown, Downtown, downtown. you know, the hyphenated Harriet, you know, she's downtown, yeah. she's, as, as Mary Jane said, Uptown, yeah. she's the swell, downtown, she's, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and I think Lucy and Jesse was the same idea that it's yeah. both her, you know, I can tell you a story of the two, uh, I can't remember the lyric is, but yeah, no, it's yeah. her, it's the, the two different sides of her. I never quite I understood what Michael Bennett didn't like about Uptown, Downtown. Yeah. I don't um, either, because we wound up doing this, the same music and the same choreography and we put it to Lucy and Jesse from Uptown Downtown and it, it, that was surreal for me as a dancer I, it, because we learned that pattern too there were two different patterns in the middle now if you see Lucy X you know and we had gone we did the one if I recall right Michael didn't we learn that one day and we put it in the net that night oh yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah. Now, now kids want their break you know I was, a little, I was a little disappointed by uh, changing the music to the yeah. new one, uh, yeah. only because I kind of like the old one. Yeah, uh, I it was a little, I, a little I, bit bluesy. I like Lucy Jesse better. I thought it, there was something a little more snappy about it. I, I got to why. like it. I, I got yeah. to like it, and I understood why they did it more. Yeah. Uh, but and when they first changed, of course, when you're in a show, and especially when you're out of town, and they change entire numbers, yeah. <laughs> it's a little unsettling. In one day. You know? In one yeah, day. in one day, and then you have to <laughs> yeah. go perform it that night. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's kind of kind of strange, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but the number was. I thought the number was terrific. I mean, of course, yeah. we had our back to the audience. I've never had my back to the audience during an entire number, <laughs> that, so that was a little that, strange. It is my belief in brief. Jesse is classy, but virtually dead. Lucy wants to be classy. 
Jesse wants to be Lassie. If Lucy and Jesse could only combine, I could tell you someone who would finally be just one. Charles, I'm going to have to leave. Sorry. <laughs> But thank oh. you so much. This was great fun. It was wonderful oh. to see everybody. Oh, good. It's to nice to meet you. Well, yeah. thank I you. Thank you. You all get vaccinated. <laughs> I did. Yes. 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 I did. Good. Great. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, going on, um, I think that it is a testament to Follies that some of the cut songs are almost as famous as some of the songs that remained in the show. So I would love to ask about sort of when and why those songs were cut, like Can That Boy Fox Trotten? You were mentioning Uptown, Downtown. Them. I remember when they were talking about Can That Boy Fox Trot, after, once she had said early in the song, oh boy, can that boy Fox Trot, that was the, that, that was, was the payoff. And that was yeah. the, the whole show, that was the whole song. So it was just more of the same. And I think right. they came up with a much better. Yeah. Um, yes. I think it, it was kind of a one joke song and and you they gave it away right away and then it was over, you know? And then Steve wrote this, because it was Yvonne DeCarlo who had the biggest name of anybody. Yeah. Steve wrote this whole big complicated middle section where she actually set the stage of when she was in college in there. <laughs> oh, right, you know, I forgot. The, the poet who's, who you know, had a high voice and the football player had the low voice. And, you know, and the interesting thing is I remember when, when I was doing the book, that whole middle section was cut before we opened in Boston. Yeah. So, and, and the decision had been made then to replace it with something. So, um, I, I mean, part of the fun that I did is I looked at all the Boston reviews that I could find to see if the press picked up on the fact that Can That Boy Foxtrot might not be the right song there, which they didn't. Um, but I just, but we knew it, we knew it just, it, it just, it was the one joke song. And, and it's funny because I think Sondheim explained it. It was kind of like if we, when he would be at a party um, with Elaine Stritch and she'd be in her cups, you know, and she'd go over to the table and said, play a song, you know, and he'd play something and she'd sing the first line and then forget the rest of the lyrics. So I think in his mind, it was kind of a, you know, late night boozy, um, yeah. you know, some, yeah. some old broad doing a, you know, doing yeah. one of those numbers and, yeah. Anyway, so, but yeah, no, it's in the birdcage for God's sake. I mean, it's, it's a song that doesn't go away. And an, another, wasn't it also in um, a Shirley MacLaine movie, I think. So. Oh. Yeah. I remember they sent, sent how, um, they sent Stephen to the ladies lounge in Boston at the Colonial. And I think that's where he wrote, I'm still here. Came back with something <laughs> like 10 times. <laughs> I think you're right. I remember that. I, remember I didn't that. know that. <laughs> Yeah. I do remember, I mean, part of the fun of, of my position is I remember him handing me the manuscript because the stage manager needed the lyrics typed out for the script. So, you know, I hand the manuscript and I go up to the stage manager's office on the fifth floor with an old red electric typewriter, you know, with the <laughs> carbon papers. And I'm looking at the manuscript and I'm typing these lyrics. And I, I do remember thinking, man, these are good. I, I wonder what the music is. These are lyrics. Yeah. It's like a like an encyclopedia of the 1930s. It's like amazing. Didn't so. make up your own tune, like, you know, humming as you type? No, 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 no. But I thought, I mean, they, they want, believe me, I had no time. They wanted it. The stage managers wanted it and they wanted it now. Oh. So. I remember, I sort of remember that vaguely. I do too. <laughs> and how did you all feel about the critical reception to Follies on Broadway once you got to opening night? Hmm. Susan, you had to <laughs> yeah. deal with it. Well, as I said, boy, half the people hated it and half the people loved it. It was yeah. just so- There was no in between. It was nothing in between. I mean, it was, and, and people were like, you know, they weren't just sort of wishy-washy about it. They were really, yeah. you know, some of them yeah. were really vicious and others were euphoric. It was, I don't think I've ever quite seen anything like that. And then of course, Frank Rich's review as an undergraduate and when we were in Boston, that he wrote the, the review for the Harvard Crimson called The Last Musical. And what was so fascinating, especially in retrospect is he got the show nobody else yeah and it was like whoa i remember even a little bit of that's what the show is okay you know <laughs> thank you um, yeah. but it, i you know it, and, and he, he sondheim reached out to him 
you know, and thanked him and basically because, you know, he was Sondheim was struggling with the people who didn't like the show. And I think it gave him a lot of, um, you know, energy to think that, 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 that somebody in the critical community, even if it's an undergraduate, granted at Harvard, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that somebody would get this so that we can just soldier on and keep working on this show and, you know, making it better and better. I remember opening night. Sorry, I'm sorry, Susan. No, go ahead. Go I ahead. just remember, I remember being at opening night and being, I mean, at the after party, you know, the party after the show, the opening night party. And I remember when the reviews came in and and it was really disappointing. It was strange. It was really- Hal read them, a remember? Bummer. It was a bummer. Hal read them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hal read some yeah. of them. It was like, oh dear. Yeah. Oh, funny. I, I will say that when, when I wrote my book, I, I wanted both Hal and Steve to be okay that I was gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I had a manuscript, I sent it to them and they each of them had a, a, a notion, but Hal's notion, he went to that to opening night party and I had quoted him as saying, the last time we were here was for, for Fiddler on the Roof, but this time it means more. And he okay. said to me, mm, you know, could we, I mean, because I was the director, I wasn't the director of Fiddler on the Roof. And I did, I did change it. I split it up a little bit, but I thought he doesn't want to get the call from Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick. <laughs> you know, but it's fine. I mean, I, I was, you know, yeah. I, there was nothing that I did that I didn't, that I thought would sort of take away from the character of what I was trying to capture. Somebody yeah. just, just today I saw on Facebook, somebody posted Walter Kerr's review. Oh, it, yeah. You know, I, a long time ago and I sort of shocking to read it again. And he hated it, yeah. He hated yeah. it. He hated it. And and all the things that we hold so dear and we think of it, you know, it's so magical. And I mean like the moment that Loveland starts when it goes, you know, and you go, it just happens. It, it just, you know, it's just like uh, you kind of don't know what it is, but you're just it's like you're transformed. And he, he just hated it. <laughs> beloved comprehends. It's funny, I'm looking at one of the articles in the New York Times today, and they have all those hot spots you can click in. And one of them was the, the um, mm -hmm. Time Magazine cover story um, with the picture of Alexis. And then it said, read the, full, read the article here. So I read it. And what was so interesting is even though clearly enough of the people at, the, at Time Magazine were on its, in its favor to, you know, to do it, there's a line about, you know, this one line, you know, even though some of it's, you know, 
pedestrian and blah, blah, blah. and I said, you really had to write that? Okay. Yeah. You know, in those days, you used to also hope that if the Daily Times critic didn't like something, that the Sunday critic would like it or, yeah. or that you'd get another found someplace else. And that was like, ba boom. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember, didn't when they did the when they did the Lincoln Center revival, just the concert version, um, and I and people wrote about it. I thought, where were you, you know, back then? Because they were raving about it. And and I remember thinking, well, well, then why the heck did you pan it back then? You know, I always that, wanted to put the reviews side by side and see what they really said. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, it was such a, a strange musical, I think, in comparison to everything that had been done. I think that sometimes people and, and the, the premises of the people and how they fit with each other wasn't always very nice. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to deal with real life stuff. Yeah. You know, and I think some of that was in that, too. I, I mean, I'm talking now because I'm older now, but at the time I didn't understand it. I just. Mm -hmm. I just accepted it. I just thought it was brilliant, you know, because of the people I worked with and you were all so good and, you know, the, it was just good. And, but, you know, I don't think people want to deal with real life problems like that. I mean, what do you mean? You wanted him and she, he went with her and it, who want they don't to want to see, him. they want to go to this, Good they point. want to go, there were, there's all those people then that wanted to go and see something happy, you know, right. a happy ending and a happy this, and, you know, in a way it was a good ending. I mean, yeah. poor Sally had a breakdown but the other couple were going to try to work on it you know and yeah. and Sally's husband still was going to help her you know and they were going to get together I, I think maybe there should be another little scene written sometime <laughs> to put it together you know because every time I've done big versions I've only done it like in Houston Grand Opera twice I guess I did it and Michigan Opera Theater so we had some production value because you have to have you have to have the production value. I'm sorry, you know, yeah. and um, we always tried to kind of finish it somehow so that it was a little more upbeat, you know, and I think that was part of the problem. People don't want to deal with divorce and screwing around and that, I shouldn't say that, but you know, that's what happened. You know, I think, I think it was too, too soon in its time. Yeah. You know, even even company, even though it dealt with things like that, it was a little more happy. Right. I think it had a more happy feel to it, you know. Also, to Marty's point about the concert, I was there at the concert in, in 85. And what's really was really interesting is, you know, beautiful girls, you know, and I think you can hear this on the recording. I mean, it was it was you know, Lee Remick and Carol Burnett and, you know, Phyllis Newman. And it was one. So they, they shrieked every time another lady came down. That yeah. was great. You know, and then you had, you know, some numbers that were great. And um, and then then I remember feeling there was a when it got a little sort of slow in the middle there when it was, you know, leaning they on the, stars. Well, leaning on the book songs, which, you know, in concert were and then Mandy yeah. Patinkin. First of all, he started and flubbed. Uh, yeah. And then went back and he did he did Buddy's Blues all by himself. He's the first person I think who ever did that. And I remember thinking, good on you, Mandy, because now you have cemented this evening as a major event by doing this twist on it that is going to make everybody say, oh, yes, now I'm, you know, absolutely. This is, it was a great, it was a, it was a very exciting evening. Yeah, it was. I've got those whisper how I'm better than I think, but what do you know, blues? That why do you keep telling me I stink when I adore you feeling? That say I'm all the world to you, you out of your mind. I know there's someone else and I could kiss you behind. Cause you say I'm terrific, but your taste was always rotten feeling. Those go away, I need you. Come to me, I'll kill you. Darling, I'll do anything to keep you with me till you tell me that you love me or you did not mean to tell you. She says she really loves me. Another. She says, bird, bird. She says, I like, like, like. Then she prefers. You deal, a bird. She says that anybody. Buddy blue. She says would suit her more than I. I, I, I. She says that I'm a washout. She says, I love her so much I could die. <laughs> Oh, 
wish I'd have seen that. I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to be doing it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And Michael, Michael and Hal were both there. That I remember. I, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And Michael, Michael, although probably helped along by some substance, was it was in a very cheerful mood. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Michael wasn't. Oh. <laughs> And I'd love to ask more about Michael Bennett. And I think the person to ask about that is Mary Jane Houdina, since you were his assistant. Um, well, M Michael was, um, what can I say for Michael? I liked Michael, but Michael could be tough. He could be tough on you, even if he liked you. I mean, I remember the, my entrance for young Hattie to follow Hattie Walker out, young Broadway baby. He, he gave me this little step to do. and. It, we did, I think, three openings. Did we do three before we, we finally settled on the last one? And so I was doing a little more dancing at the beginning of that. And he, I did it. And I, I'm a fairly good dancer, I could say. You know, um, I, I finished it. And, you know, you kind of always looked at him because he was, it was you wanted his approval somehow. And um, he, he gave me one of these, uh, like this. And it was like, it's, why didn't he just break my balloon? You know, I mean, that's, that's how I felt. Um, but on the other hand, over the years, as I got older, I was able to, I never played any, well, I think you said that, Ted, I took no, I did take any punches from him. I can't remember exactly how you put that, but I did, I used to just, after a little bit of that, I would just say to him, well, what do you want, Michael? How do you want it? What do you want? <laughs> you know? And, um, and I think he respected me for that. Um, even, you know, I, after Follies, I worked with um, Peter Gennaro for a long time, and another girl and I did an act with him, Nancy Dalton, and it was wonderful, and we played at the grand finale, and Michael came, you know, and it was just at, around the chorus line time, and um, we all both auditioned, and he came in, and he had a little substance going on. I think Tommy Toon was, in, was with him, and Michael Stewart was with him, and they came in, and Michael's, here's to singing and dance, and how come I don't have you girls in my show? I said, well, Michael, we auditioned. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, at that point, I could, I said anything to him, you know, yeah. and, um, and I, but, you know, I knew Michael, you know, Michael and I studied with the same dance teacher in Niagara Falls, New York. And, um, but he was one of the big kids. He left by the time I came in. And before I left to go to New York, he had come back for some reason um, to Buffalo for a visit. And he came up to the studio and I just happened to be doing my solo for the recital that year. And, and I was mortified because my teacher made me dance for him, you know? So we go back a long way. And um, he, he often asked me about tap steps. He would get me in the corner, you know? And, um, and I was more than happy to do that. But as the time went on, it got to a point one time he sees me, he was re rehearsing chorus line. We were doing the Milliken show. And he again asked me, he said, what about those, you know, would you remember any of those tap steps? I said, you know, M Michael, I forgot him. You know, cause he asked me too many times. And, but uh, on top of all of that, I admired what he did. And I think if he needed 10 girls that were anything like what I was, I had a job, you know? And I actually was, um, Get, my name was given by him to different choreographers at different times and uh, to assist them. So I knew he, I think he appreciated my talents, you know, and um, I, your question was, what do I think of him? I liked Michael. I just think he was tough. He, he scared, was just tough. He scared the pants off of me. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, when I first came to the show, somebody said to me, Whatever you do, do not cry in front of Michael Bennett. Yes, you'll you don't cry. Crying. The yeah. other thing is we always made sure we had makeup on and we had a nice outfit on. Yeah. You well, would he, never go and cut out, cut out stuff and no makeup yeah. and your hair flying around. You came in ready to look good. To dance, I know. Which I think I, I appreciated that. This is interesting I, to hear because I, I, ne I never had any kind of experience like that with Michael. Uh, he was always nice and friendly, and when we worked on the bolero and everything, uh, uh -huh. I, I just never saw that side of him. I don't. Think. He, you, he wasn't you were dancers. You you were dancers. I I didn't come in as a particular particular dancer, and so I used to go. Uh, I I learned half of the mirror number in the bathroom because well I my <laughs> my big story there is that I I um. Uh, went in, I got up, I got upset. I was having trouble learning the mirror part of the mirror number. So I 
you know, ran and hid in the bathroom and I was sitting in a stall kind of, <laughs> kind of sobbing a little bit. Oh. And someone in the stall next to me was sobbing and we came, came out and it was Dorothy and the two of oh. us. So then <laughs> and Bobby Avian came into the ladies room with us and to retrieve us. And then he helped us get that particular step and then come out of the bathroom. Yeah. So, <clears throat> he, he was I, tough he was tough he was tough he was just tough he wanted to see what he wanted to see and he wanted to see it that way you yeah. know and some of that I appreciate now that I'm choreographing you know I I appreciate that and um because that's what you want to do you don't kind of want to go in backwards and not get what you need or what it should look like and um so in again as I said he he and I had I don't think we were friends but I think we were friendly places yeah. and um and we actually that we had one moment in time there was a party I think it was at Dick Latessa's house and he and I sat in a corner and we chatted about how that teacher affected us and just for a second I felt like it was me and him in the dance studio and he was I think he was like four years older than me so he probably was 20 and I was like 16 at the time you know what I mean that's how I felt we had that conversation yeah. so so I think I think we were we were good we were good I just he was just tough and um but I thought he was brilliant I thought he was a yeah. good director too to be yeah. honest with you yeah so I uh, so I I just felt a little love hate with him but I do I admired him and I respected him and he was good to me you know as I said if he needed anything 10 dancers like I was he would hire me you know that's great yeah. And the other Michael Macedo, who's here, um, I would love to ask about your relationship with your older counterpart, Vincent, because? Oh, well, we got along well. I mean, they were beautiful dancers, the two of them. Yeah. And uh, I was excited about uh, being on the stage with Jane, because she was also in your hit parade. And I used to watch her and Dorothy when I was a little kid. Ah. Me too. I used to, uh, on every Saturday night, my sister and I would sit and watch all these shows while my mom and dad out, went out dancing. And we watched all of those shows. And so it was such an exciting thing and thrilling to be on the stage with Jane, who was my favorite dancer at that time, and uh, uh, also with, with Dorothy. And uh, we worked well together, all of us. I mean, like I say, we saw that, that bit of a cut that you put in, and there was a lot of them dancing. They were terrific. I mean, yeah. I don't know why the uh, we as their younger counterparts really even needed to be on the stage <laughs> with them. Oh, no, I mean, they could have done the whole thing. It was brilliant. And I always felt that uh, uh, Graziella could dance the whole number by herself, <laughs> including <laughs> the lifts. I mean, she, true. she was fierce. She yeah. could do uh, just about anything. You, you guys and, were and, brilliant. Uh, Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Just oh, beautiful. Just beautiful. Oh. Just beautiful. You know, that number was very different when it started. Yeah. And we worked in, with Bob Avian and Michael. And Bob Avian had a lot of input into that yeah. number. And yeah. uh, we would work it. And it was slow. And then it would go a little faster. Then it was slow. And it was very romantic and very sensual. And then when Michael said, in order to keep it in the show, we have to speed it up. That was a bit of a disappointment uh, for all it, of us. Because we is. just loved doing it the way we were originally doing it. And now the whole thing was more like a dance yeah. as opposed to this really sensual, beautiful number. But uh, I, we were pleased eventually with it, it you know, and, and managed well, to work it out. You were beautiful. Oh, thanks. It Thank was you. just beautiful. I used to watch that every night. I used to stand in the wing and watch that. That one night that you just missed your you cue. I did. I used to oh watch it. Oh, my God. Yeah. I was upstairs. I was upstairs I know, in the top I floor that. dressing room. I was reading a book. <laughs> I, I was always that. reading between all the numbers and I sit there all of a sudden I hear the music start my en entrance music start yep. and I did my jacket on or anything I jumped up and threw that jacket on as I was running down the stage I ran right out on stage right at the end of the big entry right into her arms and we <laughs> looked at each other and she had this smile yeah. on her face like, like nice to sure. see you yeah. <laughs> but i had no doubt she could she would have continued yeah. doing the entire number without me oh, sure. you know she, sure. she was she was fierce she was great yeah, yeah that was kind of scary but <laughs> i managed to get out there so. nice to see you <laughs>
Mm-hmm. And can you, all of you, ever remember anything else sort of going wrong on stage? Well, the first time we did, um, Michael had this idea from Lucy Jesse to Live, Laugh, Love, the girls were going to, we, for Lucy and Jesse, we were all supposed to look like boys. My, um, Steve Brookvar was behind me. We had breakaway pants, the girls. He ripped my pants off. I dropped my jacket and I grabbed a cane and I stepped out. I was the last one off and the first one back on and I could just make it. Well, one day in Boston, Michael decided that we should also wear Harlow wigs, oh, blonde geez. wigs. So in the, drop, ripped the pants, dropped the jacket, lift the hat, one of the hairdressers grabbed the red wig I had on and put the white wig on me and I had short hair so it wasn't so bad for me I put the hat on and I stepped out I got down and the other half of the line came from the other side I was stage left stage I look across the stage left and there's Julie Pars with this big black curl hanging out from underneath her blonde wig and somebody and Suzanne Rogers had a red curl hanging out and it struck me so funny it was like the rape of the Sabine women I mean we were we were on and off so fast and Michael Bennett came back, it it was a matinee day, and he puffed puff with a cigarette and said, cut the wigs. Okay, thank (laughs) God. It was just a mess. It was just a mess. I remember, I remember they were trying to put an, uh, an intermission in. And so they had, I think it was the end of too many mornings, they had Dorothy and John kissing, wasn't it kissing? And then, and then they, when the audience came back from intermission, the curtain went up and they were still embraced to show that no time had elapsed except the audience laughed hysterically because it looked like they'd been kissing all through the intermission <laughs> so it, it didn't quite work it didn't yeah. work that got tough. That got yeah. tough. I, re- I remember when uh, uh graziella we went through a period of several performances where she kept getting her heel caught in her dress and mm-hmm. she literally fell yeah and she'd be on the floor and then i'd be trying to ad lib reaching for her dance wise and everything and she, her arms would be here and there and she'd be dramatically posing and all the stuff because she couldn't get up yeah, because of her dress and then yeah. finally get up and it, it wasn't the dress it was what was underneath all those the frilly things yeah. yeah and she uh we'd go off stage very slowly and she'd have this long piece of that tool is it <laughs> tool, <laughs> dragging yes. behind her as we're walking off stage you know very very dramatically but that was kind of a nightmare that she, that happened during about three or five performances i think and they couldn't quite correct it yeah you That's know different. so we never knew when it was going to happen it happened in different parts of the number each time so yeah. uh, well but they finally fixed it we were okay after that but that i think that was the biggest uh, problem that we yeah. had aside yeah. from the stage yeah, yeah. <laughs> that stage was something else wasn't it yeah i think everybody okay. was going to the and we had to, we had to end it from, yeah we had to end the number dramatically right on the tip that was a little bit hanging over the uh orchestra pit oh. and every day every now every time we do it i'd be like oh god let me let me grab her and hold her and not both of us go off into the pit into the you pit. know well, that was constantly a, a bit of a worry of mine. So, uh, it, it, well, it changed uh, but, your whole your whole feeling about your balance, you know. Oh, it did. And um, it was really hard to to work on that. Uh, do you recall though? I I don't think anybody, is, in spite of that stage and all those ladies having to come down all those steps. Nobody um, fell. I don't recall anyone falling or no. No, I don't yeah. call anybody. And also, the, the, do you remember? Do you remember closing? Well, I didn't. The show was going to go move to California. I think I left three months because they brought the replacements in. I I didn't want to go out on tour, so a handful of us left. I think. Um, yeah, and the I'd last look. night that I was in the show, I used to come down stage left, spiral staircase, and you and Grazi came down stage right. Right. Do you remember? I never all that whole time because we practiced in the warehouse on those stairs. Remember. We practiced uh-huh. there so that when we got on the stage, we were good. Um, Pete, the shoe man, he said to me, how high you want the heel on your boot? Because I, I had black satin boots. And I, at that time, he made all our shoes. I wasn't doing that much. So I said, oh, he said, how about three? I said, that's fine. Go ahead. And I could have killed myself because then all of a sudden, Michael said, now on this, remember, because I think he did that to you too. Uh, on this count of eight, I want you here. That count of eight, I want you there. Because we actually did our own openings. 
didn't happen to me for like a year and so how many months I caught the back of that heel on one of the steps and I I I like lurched forward but I my foot slammed down on the stage and you and Grazi I don't remember, remember this went like this <laughs> you know in the slow motion <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at them and went but I was okay and I kept moving do you remember that I, I thought oh my god last that. night and I'm gonna go yeah. down the stairs but I really remember is the first two weeks of rehearsal we did that opening number, which was all in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And I yes. remember all of us going nuts over, oh my God, are we ever gonna actually move? You know, because we'd go over it and over it and over it, you know? And, and I was used yeah. to being in shows that had big, big flashy numbers for the opening number and everything. So it was very different for me to do yeah. this show. Yeah, yeah. I loved it though. Yeah. I loved doing it. I, 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 I really- stories, it's wonderful. <laughs> I love getting into that opening because you know I really I would do Broadway Baby while I was skulking around the stage. Oh yeah. <laughs> as I thought she as I thought Ethel would have done it as a young woman. That's what I did. We were doing mirror, we were singing mirror, mirror. You did the mirror. mirror. We were mouthing mirror, mirror on the wall. I we, didn't remember that. And I think I told music. somebody the wrong thing. Yeah, but the music I didn't think that you yeah, the mu that music, that's a piece of music that was supposed to be a song, wasn't it? Wasn't that supposed to be a song for Dorothy? All Things Bright and Beautiful. It was written for, for Sally in an earlier version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it became sure. underscore. <laughs> But also, yeah, I, I just wanted, to, I wanted to, to, to point out that that when 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 everybody talks about the rake stage, the rake stage was like four different rake levels. I mean, the basic yeah. thing was raked one way, and then there was the, the you know, and that yeah. must have been in, insane. The top one, the top, that diamond on the top, that, top that was diamond. lethal. Yeah, because yeah. I did the whole part, first part of Loveland on that, and Michael, that's where you stood for uh, Lucy and Jesse, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. and also also for the bolero we came down all the rake stages in the big uh, opening yeah. to get down yeah. to the bottom rake stage in order yeah. to do it so uh i think maybe because it was also treacherous everybody was especially careful careful Grazi says except she's never gotten your heel what what you say for your heel yeah. <laughs> your high heel you know oh, oh yeah opening night too when you talk about dragon tool i i just remembered my uh, love land dress, you know, there was like that bit, that bottom poof, I called it. And every so often there was a flower. So it wasn't attached except by where the flower was. When I stepped up onto that diamond rake, the back of it swung and caught on the points. Huh. And you know, when I came downstage, I, I was mortified because I was afraid. I thought Michael's gonna rip me a new one for this. I dragged about three three feet of tool behind me. It ripped <laughs> off the bottom and I went all the way down to the end. So I dragged it all the way down the stairs, down the rake, down to my downstage right. Oh God. And I, for the rest of the number, it, it laid there like that. And I thought, oh, he's gonna kill me. He never said a word to me. So either he didn't see it or he was okay. <laughs> what, one of my favorite random memories, this has nothing to do with performance, but I remember Fritz Holt used to call places, please, you know, five minutes and then he'd right. call places, please, places. And, and not, the show wouldn't start. And then you, he came back on, he said, Ursula, would you get your ass down here, please? <laughs> and <laughs> Ursula, right. who spoke German, used to speak, spew German all the way down the stairs <laughs> from the top to go get a place. Wasn't she I, always... I, wasn't she always a little bit behind? Wasn't she always a little she was late? A, she was late. Yeah, yeah she was always. always late coming down for places. Yeah. But because she was in a rush. Do you remember ready. when we were in Boston and everybody was because it was not we we weren't used our skin wasn't used to having all that white makeup. All the white makeup. And we had right. a meeting with Michael and I don't remember. I, Hale must have been there. Your puppy. Yeah. So we were down there in the colonial, uh, and, and Ursula started. She says, Michael, what am I supposed to do with all my lovers? My skin is starting to break out and all this stuff. And Michael looked at all of us and said, Puff, puff. He said, If you girls can't wear it, I'll get a chorus that can. And that was the end <laughs> of talking about the white yeah. makeup. They did get us stuff, though, you know, Albaline yeah. and stuff to wash yeah. with that was yeah. gentle and all of that. Yeah. But that's what he said. Do you remember that? That was the end. Whoop. Okay. 
So this next question to Susan Shulman, especially, but also to everyone, which is one of the most sort of egregious Tony losses in history is Follies as best musical. So what can you sort of remember about when this happened? And I ask this to you because were you depending on this for publicity? Were you expecting it? I actually wasn't involved. When I was working on this show, I was a very low level press agent. And the only reason that I got to be as involved as I was, was because the press agent I worked for, who was named Mary Bryant, who was a wonderful press agent, was very um, um, committed to Hal Prince. She had done many, many Hal Prince shows and her loyalty was to Hal Prince. And so early in her career, she had been a young press agent in another press office. And Hal Prince had come along and scooped her up and said, come with me, my young friend, I will make you my press agent. And so Mary Bryant's loyalty was very much to Hal Prince and to whatever Hal Prince wanted. And because she was so focused on Hal Prince, I got to do stuff that normally a young press agent wouldn't have gotten to do on a show. I mean, I was much more involved with the leads at that time, but I wasn't, normally I wouldn't have been. So because, but anything to do with Hal Prince was Mary. And I actually wasn't allowed to be in the same room with Hal Prince. Huh? Why? No. Because... <laughs> No, there was a, she had, there, she wasn't mean or anything. It was because she had had this experience where he saw something in her and said, come with me, I'm going to make you a star. And she didn't want that to happen with anybody else. Oh. And not that I was the least bit of a threat to, to, to Mary Bryant. Believe me, I was, you know, a very young thing. And so I was very much in a box of what I was allowed to do and what I wasn't allowed to do. And so when you say, what was the reaction? I wasn't in the room where it happened. Yeah, I, I thought it was appalling because we too. won so many things. We yeah. won so many, everything. And two gentlemen of Verona is one for best musical that year. And it's like, what? I you know, know. Yeah. you look in the long run, especially where, yeah. you know, who does that show anymore? You know? Yeah. But one fun thing was when John Guerra accepted the Tony for Two Gentlemen of Verona, he said, I was an investor in Follies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot about Which that. Which is true. Yeah. <laughs> we won, what did we win? We won Best mu in Music, right? Yeah. We won like six or seven yeah. Tonys and then just not the big one. Mm. It was ridiculous. Well, I never understood <laughs> how, uh, how a show or a film, a movie, uh, can win all of those and yet not be the best movie or or yeah. musical. I know. It I seems know. odd. It's like, oh, you're great at everything but this one thing. Right. I know. I know. So, uh, Crazy. I've spent too many years in the Tony Award room to tell you of you know, to, to having watched time and time again the, the, yeah. the wrong things happen. Yeah. It was crazy. And so what is it like to be in a rehearsal room with Stephen Sondheim, who's of course the master, they say, and he is? I thought he was a doll. I, my first day of rehearsal, or, well, everybody's first day of rehearsal, I got there early. I was nervous and I got there. I'm always a little early, but I was exceptionally early. And I went in and I, I looked around the room at 19th Street, right? And I see the piano and I see the chairs set up, you know, for everybody to sit. And I kind of went to the corner. I think I put my coat up. And by the time I came back, I sat down. And when I turned around, this man was sitting at the piano. And I said to him, hello, my name's Mary Jane Houdini. And he said, hi, I'm Stephen Sondheim. And I went, <laughs> you know, I said, well, hi, how are you? You know, <laughs> I, I just thought he was wonderful. He was very nice. He's always I didn't have a lot to do with him, but he was always very um, sweet to me and like uh, congenial. How are you? I'm good. I bumped into him on the street a couple of times. Hi, how are you? He always knew who I was, you know? So I, I just thought he was wonderful. I liked Hal. I thought he was a, a great guy and, and yeah. interesting. And, and uh, but my fondest memory of him is standing backstage before I was going to go on. And we're talking and all of a sudden he said, I'm going to raise the ticket prices to fifteen dollars, and I turned to him. And I said, "Hal, nobody's going to pay fifteen dollars <laughs> to go see a musical." 
<laughs> and now when I hear people paying three hundred and four hundred dollars to go see a show, I, I'm shocked, you know. But that's why he's the producer and I was just the performer. <laughs> I thought they were. I thought. I thought Hal. Hal had a great sense of what he wanted, and he would give you a line reading if he thought he wasn't getting what he wanted. And and I. I always found Stephen to be just really kind. And I. I. Mm -hmm. My. I got to know him a little bit better with the uh, tribute, the Sondheim tribute, because we got to rehearse at his house and stuff, and that was really cool. So, he's just amazing. Yeah. Well, he's he's a real man of the theater, and and yeah. you know, and he he mm -hmm. likes working with actors. He likes actors. He wants his lyrics mm -hmm. enunciated, and he wants yep. the rhythms correct. And but you know, any good composer lyricist will do the same. Yeah. But I um I remember when when encores did anyone can whistle, and I was over at a, a you know at a rehearsal and and some somebody in the cast want, you know was sort of squatted down in in, in the front. Um, of the stage and, and Steve was in the house and, and, and asked for something and he sort of trunged, you know, trundled down the, uh, the aisle and just looked up Sutton Foster, I think it was. And I just watched, here was Sutton Foster, you know, crouched down and Sondheim was looking up and they were talking about something. And I just thought, you know, not, he's revered now in this great way, but at the end of the day, it's like, can you, can you help me with this moment? And he's always there to do that. I think it's, yeah. you know, he really is a man of the theater. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was. He's brilliant. Oh. So tell me a little bit about the ending of each of your journeys with Follies, either your closing night or the closing night, depending on if you stayed or oh. all of that. The, the last night on Broadway was the most amazing night because the audience stood and screamed and cheered for every single number it was such it was just teary I mean I think the show ran late because it was just such a high and such a uh, I mean as as, as uh, Susan said they either loved the show or hated it and the people who loved it came back for closing night on Broadway yeah. it was just it was just stunning I mean I went home on air walking on air it was just amazing were you there Sue were you guys were you there um Ted closing I, well, I wasn't I was I was working yeah, on something I, else and I, I couldn't else, I couldn't yeah. be there and and of course my um you know I would like to think there's no end to my yeah. I mean, it's funny I, I got a, an email yesterday from a one of the pr big producers in South Africa who, wow. who who just said I you know because of Folly's 50th I picked up your book and read it again and it's just uh -huh. the thing that he said that I loved he said it, it's like it was published yesterday yeah and I thought for yeah. you know for a book that's about something that happened 50 years ago um, that couldn't be, a, there couldn't be a better thing, you know, to yeah. say. And I tried, it's interesting that, you know, the fact that I said to, to Michael earlier, he was on the list of people I couldn't get to the other, another person, I mean, Jean um, Rosenthal, the, the lighting designer, I really wanted to talk to her because I'm not that technically savvy, but I really wanted to talk to her and I tried and, but I just, I couldn't, you know, so I had to sort of try to be as clever as I could about, the lighting without really having had a, you know, a, 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 a real conversation that I would have liked. And so actually, you know, all of these kind of conversations, I think, oh, I could go back in and fix it. Write some more. <laughs> yeah. About the night, the, the night that I left, because uh, I left, as I said a little earlier, because I didn't want to go out of town and I was able to do the Millican show. So I left, I think two months maybe earlier. And I was very touched because at the end of the, the show that night, I sat on top of the piano for the curtain call um, mm -hmm. up on that level on stage left. And I'm sitting there and I, I looked up and the whole cast had turned to me and they applauded to me. Oh. And which I, I always remembered that. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, it was yeah. very touching. My my last experience with Follies was Kurt and Harvey and Virginia and I were invited to Michigan Opera Theater, Michigan Theater, and we did we played the older parts. It was sort of a con it was a concert version with with some staging, um, and we played the old you know we play I played Dorothy's part and 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 we all played the older parts and it was it was it was really very touching found out about this I got myself there and the, and my little follies moment about that is I remember walking in the back of the theater and looking up on stage and realizing look who those yeah. people are yeah 
Really look, who's, look who I'm looking I know at. I always was sort of sad afterwards because they had talked about doing something with it more with it but it never didn't happen but unfortunately because I, I loved it I love doing it great so idea fun. it was so fun I don't know why nobody ever thought of that you know after the show closed and well you know, when we did the first time we did uh, Houston Grand Opera it was to open the Wortham Center and um Oh, I can't say his name now, the producer that was there, he had what they called the uh, star train. And Dorothy came and Alexis came and who else was there? Ruby Keeler was there that night. Huh. And um, Harvey did, uh, buddy. He did, buddy. Yeah. And he and I looked, yeah, Har he and I looked at each other because it was funny because I got to do it because Fritz gave Chuck Abbott my name. Chuck was mm -hmm. directing it. And it was kind of like coming full circle somehow for the mm -hmm. two of us, you know, because I know Harvey for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and I looked at Harvey and he looked at me. I said, wow, you know, <laughs> choreographing this. Yeah. Here we are. And he's mm -hmm. playing buddy, buddy, you know. And it, during that time was when Michael passed too, ah. Michael Bennett. And it was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of eerie, the yeah. whole thing. Um, but it was one, and, I, and we were saying, you know, you guys should be doing this someplace. <laughs> so we wanted to. We had, we had fun. Yeah. We had fun. I bet. Well, you guys were wonderful. It, it is, as it was said before, it was a very con congenial cast. Everybody really, I don't know anybody that grumbled about anybody except yeah. Fifi Dorsey. <laughs> <laughs> Fifi grumbled about everything <laughs> and everybody. Well, Fifi, so, Fifi was so, it was very uh, childlike. Yes. yes. You know, she was very sweet and she'd do things and you kind of roll your eyes, but at the same time, it wasn't with malice or anything. She was no, just, it wasn't. She was like a little girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Michael, how long did you stay in the show? Um, I'm trying to remember. I how long does the show run on Broadway? A year? A year. A little over. A year. Yeah. Uh, over a, a year. Over a year. Yeah. I think I was in it for eight, I think eight or nine months, I think. I, I didn't want to go to LA either. Yeah. So uh, but I really, to be honest, don't really recall the last performance that I did. Um, uh, then I was on, I went into something else, I think. Yeah. And I, I didn't get to see that performance you're talking about, but oh. I wish I had the it final performance. Oh, it and, was just, I didn't bad. either. I and wish I'd have seen that. Kurt came back for it. Kurt had left the yeah. show and, and he needed to do something else because I know he talks about the um, just the overwhelmingness of the reaction. Yeah. 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 This was incredible. It was an incredible moment. Just, whew, I'll never forget it. I get goosebumps now <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of funny um, that you might enjoy. When I, after I left the show, there were two older women out and Fritz Holt called me and said, Mary Jane, you have to come back and do Mirror. <laughs> and I wound up doing Sheila Smith's part because Sheila went in, I think it was Yvonne that was out because Sheila covered her. And oh. I went into Sheila's spot and Sheila's line was, I haven't danced in 30 years. Is that what her line was? Mm -hmm. I, haven't, I haven't done it. I haven't danced in 30 years. And I actually went into the costumers and they put like a wig on me and they did some makeup and, um, you know, put some lines and they laughed at me, but they said, because I was still, I was still young. So, you know, a little few lines didn't help too much. So I went to Dorothy's dressing room and I said, Dorothy, this is what I look like. And I had Sheila's pink outfit. Remember, it was like a pink top and a sequin skirt or something. Mm -hmm. And they cut it up. And because Sheila was twice as tall as like two feet taller than me. So they fixed me, they pinned me all into this thing. And um, I went to Dorothy's dressing room and I opened the door. I said, This is what I like. And she started to laugh. And remember that she had an infectious laugh. She laughed, I bet, <laughs> for five minutes. And then I went to um, Alexis's room too. I said, Alexis, this is what I look like. And she kind of giggled a little bit right and then I went on to do the number and I guess I did the two shows that day because you know they needed two women and they were only was only one woman swing Sonia Lovkova <laughs> and um and it was kind of fun because I had to do it as an older woman you know now I could do it as an older woman but <laughs> <laughs> so um Ted I want to ask you when did the inspiration sort of come to turn your diaries into a book, into everything was possible? I kept everything so that the summer after the show, 
I could put it together and get course credit. Um, you know, so, but I'm, I'm a bit of a pack rack. So I, I just kept everything Thank in a box. Yes. And then, then, well, and then, then the show started to get this aura of, uh, you know, and people would ask me and actually, um, I don't know if I say this in, in the book, but when Frank Rich was this, the senior drama critic of the near the chief drama critic of the New York Times, and I was running Rogers and Hammerstein, a mutual friend put the two of us together because Frank was writing an article on Stephen Sondheim and Oscar Hammerstein. So we planned a lunch to very, you know, to, you know and we, it, hello, hello, nice to meet you. And we sat down and I said, listen, I just have to tell you that I was a gopher on Follies and I'll, I'll never forget when your review came in from the, from the, the, the Harvard Crimson. And he looked at me and he said, you were a gopher on Follies? I said, <laughs> yes, I was. And he said, how many times did Alexis Smith cut could I leave you in Boston? And it's like suddenly if there'd been any pretense about the august critic and the Rogers and Harris, I said, gone, gone. It was like, okay, let's compare notes about Follies. <laughs> Um, wow. Which was kind of, which was kind of, kind of cool. Anyway, so, so it was actually sort of ironically at my daughter's um, school. It was a, a party, a cast party after the uh, production, and I was talking to a fellow parent, and it was after Into the Woods. So we were talking about our kids and Sondheim, and which, you know, Into the Woods, you know, was liked by the kids, and you know, and uh, to that woman, and I was, this woman is extraordinary. And I just said I, I was a gopher, and I kept a journal, and she literally looked at me. I just met her. I, and she looked at me and she said, you were a gopher on the original production of Follies and you kept a journal? I said, yeah, and I haven't kept a journal before or since. But she looked at me and she said, there's a book in this and I'm sending you to my friend who's an agent. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, she doesn't know if I can write. Nobody knows if I can write. So I, you know, waited a while and called the host of the party and said, what was that woman's name? You know, and called her and, I, and, and went to visit this agent. She said, what kind of book is this? I said, well, it's not a coffee table book. And I don't like journal books that say Monday it was raining and I attended the petunias and then I went to it. Um, and, and, but I said, and she said, do you have photographs? I said, I, I know where they are. They're not mine, but I, you know. And so she helped me put together a proposal. And funny, the, she, the thing she said to me when it was all, you know, a sample chapter and an outline and all the things that you need if you want it, writing a book. And the last thing she said to me is Bob Gottlieb has got to buy this for Knopf. This is right up his alley. And like a week later, she called and said, done. Oh and I thought, goodness. that's never wow. the way books. Never happens. Never happens. Right. And so I thought, oof. So actually, then I thought, oh, now I have to write it. So I, I, took, um, I took a few days off and um, came up here in this, I'm in my house in Connecticut. And I said to my wife, you uh, stay in New York with the dogs and the kids. I need to be alone for a few days. And because it was based on a journal that I still had, I was able to knock out about a hundred pages in a, in a week. And that sort of at least, at least taught me that I could do it. But interestingly, I had no idea how I was gonna begin it and no idea how I was gonna end it. But I didn't, it didn't matter. I just kept, there was enough to go to dive in. And, and, um, and some, it was the, I mean, there was enough internet in those days that, that I could do a little bit of research on the internet, but it's not like it is today. Um, but for the most part, I just, you know, dove in and then reached out to everybody that I could because I thought I really, you know, I don't have a, 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 an ax to grind here. I'm just, I, I have a story I want to tell. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know, the Follies Mavens will buy anything. That's great. But I really would like to do a book that can explain how a musical is put together and specifically at that time. So, um, and it was funny when I got to what the scripts were like in those days, studio duplicating, they were all the same. But I thought to myself, you know what? Nobody Charles's age or slightly older is going to have a clue what we're talking about. The Hal Prince office had one machine that you fed in, in a piece of plastic, you put a page in and you fed it into this machine and it took about 20 seconds for it to go through and come out as a copy. And that was by the Xerox company. But for my purpose is that that was useless, you know, because they, they wanted it right away. So the, I would type away in carbon paper and stuff like that. But, but I thought to myself, I need to explain what a mimeograph machine was, how when you did those scripts, that place on 43rd Street or whatever it was, Oh my and gosh. every yeah, page right. was a different, you know, a mimeograph right. and those weird sort of plastic leather covers and the two little screws. Right. So I had fun, right. Had fun thinking I've got to describe what this era is as much yeah. as I can. Yeah, that's amazing.
Yeah. That was amazing. And I, sent the, I have to say, I sent the manuscript to everybody that I could think of, because, you know, including Hal and Steve um, and, uh, and Bob Avian was brilliant because I, he just, he was great. And you just, you, just, you know, that's not actually, no, you didn't describe this right. Um, you know, and uh, it was great. Florence Klotz, oh. I think, I think I quoted in the book, she said that when she was given the assignment, she was scared shipless. <laughs> 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 Um, but, yeah, but, but I wanted I wanted to get to as many people as I possibly yeah. could, because I just thought if I'm going to do it, I want it as honest as I can possibly make it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. And what would you say was the either the most interesting interview you had or the most interesting thing you learned or found out about from an interview? Um, well, the one thing, because I had this odd career that never existed of running Rogers and Hammerstein for the last 30 years, what I found as I was going, diving back into it, time and time again, I would think, oh, that's where I learned that lesson. That's where I saw that. That's where I learned that about collaboration, which I hadn't realized. Um, so it was like one thing after another. And um, Anyway, so, so generally speaking, you know, I had those little moments all, all the way along. And the thing, you know, another thing, um, James Goldman's widow is a, is, a, is a tough customer. And the first thing she, she said to me when I met her was, um, I told her I was writing the book. I was meeting her about something else. And she said, you will get no cooperation from me. Whoa. And I thought, whoa. But then I thought, I made a decision and it was the right one. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to write it the way I want to write it. And then I'm going to give it to her. And say, you know, give me your notes. Yeah. And yeah. and it was and she was fine. She was fine. She had a couple of things she had, but she 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 gave me a lot more cooperation than I thought she was going oh, to. Good. That's good. Well, that and, kind of the way she said that was like shutting the door. It yeah, it was, it was, the door was shut pretty pretty far. The other thing was finding the photographs, because yeah. I you know I knew, I knew that. Um, Bill Yaskari, who was a, a photographer, was also the house property man at the Alvin Theater, now Neil Yes, Simon. yes. I knew he had taken pictures for Lo Look Magazine, including the, mm. the, the photograph of the showgirls on the staircase at the Colonial. And he had left the, the theater, but I tracked him down and I, I, he called me and said, where's your office? I'd written him a note I'm thinking about it. I know it's 30 years ago. And I, and he said, where, where, where is your office? He came in with a box under his arm and he handed me the box oh my God. and it was contact sheets, oh. all the contact sheets of all the photographs he took and then pages and pages of, you know, like binder pages with colored slides. Oh, oh my goodness. And I was like, oh, you know. Do you have these? Oh, I gave him back because that made the, po the point was I just went through and said I want to license this. I, wanna... I don't have one good picture. Well, I, I, um, I think I mean, you know, somebody I get I'll, happy to give you the name of his um, survivor. I don't know that they were ever married, but, uh, you know, yeah. who, um, she's a wonderful woman and works in the New York Public Library. But he was he was great. And, and the, what I loved about his photographs is, you know, they are not Steichen like photographs. But they show the process. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there's one of, is it you, Marty's uh, trying on a costume in a hotel at, at room? Mater yes. No, yeah. at Materas. Yeah, 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 yeah. So th there's yeah. that. There's a, one of the pictures I love is Hal sitting in the theater like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, another one that I have a great fondness for is all of you on stage, Hal is actually looking at the back of the auditorium and you see it's after a performance, probably a two show day in Boston. Yeah. And it's get, come on, everybody come out on stage. You're going to tell you what tomorrow is going to be. And you right. can see everybody is drained. Wiped out. Yeah. <laughs> just it's wiped out. So, that, so I just kept thinking. Michael. What? I'm sitting next to Michael in that. Yeah, yeah. Michael and Christina, I sit next to each other. I remember that. Right, yeah, yeah. right. So, I remember so, that. You know, and, and, I, and I, I found them. There were, there were some. There's actually one. What, the best color photograph of the young'uns in the Follies with your orange and blue costumes. Uh -huh. um, I could never find a cop. I could never track down the original of that of that photograph. Yeah. So that's a scam. Okay. What's in the book is this, I got the permission to do it and all that stuff, but nobody could yeah. ever provide me with a yeah. photograph. Oh. Yeah. But but I'm proud. I love the photographs that are in the book. I think they're 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 as, as important as this as the storytelling. Yeah, yeah. true. It's true. So. I would love to sort of wrap this up by asking you all one 
concluding question, which is, what do you think that the power of Follies is that it so affects every audience who sees it and everyone throughout the generations? Right, that's a tough question. That's a toughie, yeah. yeah. Well, again, for me, I think the show is, being in it, it was a real Broadway musical but then it was with Sondheim music, you know, and it was had a real style that I think is impressive. If it's done right, it's so impressive. It's not like anything else that was done, you know, and the set, the set itself was, it was just, be it was brilliant. I mean, it was, you walked in, you thought you were in a theater that was falling down, you know, yeah. and um, I think it's just, monumental and I think if you like the theater you come in and you you know something important's going to happen it's you see something's going to something's going to happen I always felt something important was going to happen that's how I felt you know but I think if you're in the theater and you love it you look and you go oh my god isn't this beautiful isn't it brilliant isn't it it's exciting it's it's all those things you know and then and it goes from there so um I just think it's it's unlike anything else yeah. And that's why people are drawn to it. Yeah, I think I, I just I, I would say that I, I think to Mary to Mary Jane's point, it's so theatrical. I mean, for a story about people that are basically in trouble, which is where the the problems that, that right. people have with the show are, but uh -huh. it it is imbued with such a love of what the theater can do. Uh -huh. Yes. So, so, and that's what I think the original production I I must say did better than any production. Hey done any <laughs> um any. and also then then the real life things that are going on with these characters the idea of the present the past how they're in conflict and what is the future going to be i think it actually touches on some universals that yes. are surprising to people because they don't expect them yeah no. yeah i thought it, it it had a magical there was something magical about magical. it that i'm not sure will ever be totally recaptured um, between the old, the past and the present and the, you know, the ghosts of your past and the, and the presence of your present. And I, I, I think it, it was just, it was a magical show. It was, I didn't, theatrical? Yeah, I think at the time, but that I, 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 I mean, I just thought every show would be like that. You know, <laughs> well, just, you would, would want every show to be like that. Yeah. I think aside to Aside from the uh, fantastic performances and everything, I think the show was just visually stunning. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think that alone Absolutely. was just, it was so uh, almost like over the top fantastic. And I'm always hearing from people who say they, they were just a kid when they saw it and they saw it six or seven times. <laughs> and I write back and I go, six or seven times you went to see the show? But a lot yeah. of people say it changed their life. I'm not sure what they meant by that, but yeah. I hear that all the time. Yeah. I got them um, when I worked in Philadelphia. I, I often work at the Walnut Street, and <laughs> he's the uh, the business manager there. And he said his I think he said it was his aunt that took him. He said, you know, I saw you when I was seven. I said, thanks. He he <laughs> and he just <laughs> loves That's the awesome. theater. He he went to see the show when he was seven years old, and he when he knew that I was in it, it changed our whole relationship. Yeah. You know, before that we were friendly, but he was a little, a little curt all the time. Once he knew I was in Follies, a man, he, he redid the, um, when they redid the, uh, um, the music on the, from the record to the CD and stuff. And they, then they redid that. I, he gave me a copy of that. And it's like, he's just was a different person with me. Yeah. Yeah, it was never bad to me, but it, all of a sudden it was much friendlier. Yeah. And he told me, he said, I saw you when I was seven. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I think the other thing about Follies, and I mean, it was, as everyone said, it was magical and it, it moved you. But the key to any show is that you want to go on the journey with those people. Yeah. That you want to find out what happens to them. You want to yeah. go on the journey. The and story. from right. the minute it started, you thought, who are these people? What are they, you know, like what, what, what? And you wanted to find mm -hmm. out. And there was something about that that just drew you in in a way that uh, some other shows don't or they don't immediately do that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's part of it, I think. Mm -hmm. That was the magic of the book, too. We didn't talk too much about James Goldman's work, but, but um, 
that's the magic of the book, the story, because it was people and reality and fantasy. And I don't know. I thought it was brilliant. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It was an important time. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. This has been really, really amazing for me to be able you were, to do one. Thank you all for agreeing. You were you. wonderful, and I thank you for asking us. Yes, yeah. thank you, Charles. Thank, thank you for thank putting you. this all together. Good to see you. Yeah. Nice seeing right. you. Hi, this is Charles Kirsch again, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed tonight as much as I have. Thank you for celebrating 50 years along with us. We so appreciate it. And before you go, we'll take a moment to honor the cast and crew of Follies that have sadly passed away since the show's inception. <laughs> We hope you have a great night and that you all echo Dee Dee's sentiment at the conclusion of the show. You know what? We should do this every year. <laughs>